Today on Investigate TV, companies lying, costing businesses and consumers over $100 billion a year. Social media is really the new frontier for illicit activity, and there's a tremendous amount of online review fraud being organized. Plus, criminals stealing house deeds, homeowners unaware until it's too late. Everything that my dad owned was in that house. I was sobbing. I was, you know, I mean, I got in my car and I got there as fast as I could. And phishing attacks hitting an all-time high. Scammers fighting to steal your identity. From the perspective of the attackers, you are always a mark ready to be ripened and harvested. Investigate TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to Investigate TV, I'm Lee Zurich. Online reviews, we all read them. A good one could be the deciding factor when you book a hotel or buy a laptop. A product with five reviews is nearly 300% more likely to be purchased than a product with none. That's according to a Northwestern University study. But some testimonials can't be trusted. We found countless examples of companies soliciting fake reviews, and our question led to a social media giant taking action. Rachel DePampa explains in Five Star Fakes. Five Star Reviews Positive Write-Up Pictures of a product in a home A thumbs up to a restaurant Confirmation your hotel is the best. We all want to know if that service or product we might buy is really worth it. Reviews are probably like the best way of free marketing for any small business or any large business. It can make you or break you. Liz Kane owns a small company in Virginia and coaches other small businesses, helping them grow. One of the big things that I promote when I'm talking to small business owners, I'm like, get as, as many reviews as possible. So that also is what gives you that online presence. What frustrates Kane is the people and businesses who don't come by those reviews honestly. You want to hear from a true consumer. You want to know that the information that you're getting is, is, is true and legitimate. It's not only frustrating when companies write their own reviews, or buy fake customer reviews, it's illegal. The Federal Trade Commission forbids the use of fake testimonials and has the power to stop and penalize parties using unfair or deceptive practices that affect commerce. But the problem goes beyond the bounds of the FTC's control. It's global. According to the World Economic Forum, a Swiss lobbying group, fake online reviews cost businesses and consumers $152 billion a year, citing figures from the world's leading e-commerce sites. On average, 4% of all online reviews are fake. We found countless posts on social media trading reviews online. This one saying, let's exchange Google reviews. No paid, no seller, only exchange. Others are asking for money. A person writing, need reviews for my Amazon products. Later asking how much for 50 reviews. Or there's this Facebook post where someone is asking for a long-term partnership, 200 to 300 reviews a month for a price. This post on Facebook asks you to buy and review a watch. Full refund after review. How serious a problem is this? Rachel, the scope of the problem is massive. I think most people don't realize how, how polluted the online review space is. Kay Dean, a former fraud investigator for the federal government, never thought she'd be deceived by online reviews. Five years ago, I used online reviews to find a doctor. And I ended up having a, a bad experience and it left me really suspicious about those reviews that I had relied on. Now she runs her own website and YouTube channel. You will be shocked at what is going on. It's called Fake Review Watch, where Dean exposes reviews like this. We'll pay $15 for each review that sticks. This is for a plastic surgeon. I've seen surgeons, psychiatrists, Wedding DJs, lactation consultants, piano teachers, 
uh, you name it. Some businesses are asking to trade. This one's looking for trip advisor reviews. If you are interested in exchanging some, private message me. And Dean's found review rings. Coordinated groups on Facebook where people join and offer to pay for reviews. Like this. If you have Yelp regular or elite profile, I need reviews. I will pay 20 for regular, 50 for elite. Social media is really the new frontier for illicit activity. And there's a tremendous amount of online review fraud being organized. In 2021, regulators in the United Kingdom got Facebook to remove 16,000 groups that were dealing in fake and misleading reviews. The company explained its policies to us in an email, but did not want to be quoted. Facebook acknowledged there's a problem here and it has a lot more work to do. The company told us computer algorithms will flag these fake review groups and then humans will investigate. It's those humans who ultimately decide if the group is pulled or the content is removed. We easily found several examples of public groups trading, buying and selling reviews. We asked Facebook how these groups were allowed to operate under its guidelines. After investigating, the company deleted the groups. In a statement, Amazon told us it suspends, bans and takes legal action against those who violate its policies. In 2021, it reported more than 16,000 abusive groups to social media sites such as Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, resulting in groups with over 11 million members being taken down. Yelp's business model is based on reviews. The company told us last year it made more than 1,000 reports to online platforms to warn them of content from nearly 950 suspicious groups, posts or individuals. TripAdvisor tells us it rejected 1.3 million reviews before they ever made it to the site in 2020. Google never responded to our request for comment. Honest businesses, particularly local businesses, lose out um, to fake reviews. Rich Cleland is the assistant director of the FTC's Division of Advertising Practices. He calls the problem serious and says consumers should be skeptical. Not every review that they see on a website is going to be legitimate and they shouldn't rely on just one source of information about a product. In May, the FTC announced it was tightening its guidelines to crack down on fake reviews and other forms of misleading marketing, including manipulating reviews by suppressing bad ones. How dangerous can a fake review be? They could be pushing a product that is a counterfeit product that has very toxic chemicals. So I'm talking about mercury and lead. Sayud Khalifa says it happened to him. He says he bought an athletic endurance supplement in 2015 off Amazon based off five star reviews. Got the product in person. It looked like someone made it in a garage, like the the tape was falling off the, the packaging. And the pills themselves look like someone put in um, wood chips from a woodworking shop. He's now the founder and CEO of FakeSpot, an online web extension and app that alerts you if a product has a fake review. It uses an A through F grading system. If you find a fake review, report it to the FTC and the platform you are using. Amazon encourages you to use the report abuse link on its site. Don't rely on the reviews or opinions of complete strangers that you've never even met because they might not even re be a real person at all. Kay Dean says word of mouth is still the best recommendation, but there are a few red flags to watch out for if you do look at the online reviews. If every single review of that product is five stars, think twice. If you see rapid fire reviews, all made within hours of each other, you should be skeptical. Read the positive and negative reviews. Look at the language. If it mentions getting a free product, has poor grammar, or just sounds like an advertisement, it likely is. For Investigate TV, I'm Rachel DePompa. To read the full statements from Amazon, Yelp, and TripAdvisor, go to our website, investigatetv.com, and search Five Star Fakes. Deed fraud, title theft, house stealing, all terms for the same thing. Criminals illegally transferring and recording real estate titles without the rightful owner's knowledge. These con artists often scan obituaries, jumping on vulnerable homes as families grieve. 
Morgan Lowe from our station in Phoenix explains. When Jerry Gottlieb left the Air Force, he turned down Harvard to run the family furniture store and provide for his children. At the age of 50, he finally got his PhD and became a marketing professor. Working at Miami, then Western Kentucky, in 2018, then 84, Jerry moved back to Scottsdale, intending to live out his final years in the small home he had been renting out. His obituary reads, Jerry had a heart of gold, and that heart failed in the early morning of March 13, 2018. He left his Scottsdale house to his daughter, Debbie. Everything that my dad owned was in that house. Debbie, who is a real estate agent, says she planned to keep the home. She and her brother left it as is until he could come to town to go through their father's things together. Sounds like the house was kind of a time capsule. Yeah, it was. In December of 2019, with her father's will going through probate, Debbie noticed something was wrong in the county tax records. So I put in his address and it um, belonged to Zillow and it showed that it was on the market and it was, on, and it was cleaned out. I went to MLS and it was empty. What went through your mind? I was sobbing. I was, you know, I mean, I got in my car and I got there as fast as I could. When she got there, the locks had been changed. Someone had literally stolen her father's home. Debbie called the agent who sold the house to Zillow. She called the police and she no, hired no. a lawyer. When Debbie came to me, the immediate response was, how are we going to get this woman's house back? David um, Degnan is Debbie's attorney. That, you know, I've dealt with similar cases like this before, but nothing this extreme. While police investigated who did this, Degnan went to work. The house was already for sale again, and Debbie discovered she and isn't so the only how. victim. A quick Google search shows that deed fraud is taking place all over the country. There are so many different stories of how deed fraud occurs. Jesse Walnick is a real estate attorney who works deed fraud cases. She says 90% of the time the thief is a friend or family member. But in that remaining 10%, victims are targeted by professional criminals. They're creating fake documents. They're recording them. They're obviously very successful or they would not be doing this. David Degnan was able to get the home back. A Zillow spokesperson wrote to us, Unfortunately, in 2019, Zillow was made aware of an identity theft related to a home we purchased, so we withdrew the sale and returned the deed to the family. Debbie says it wasn't that simple. We had to threaten. It wasn't easy. He had to send a demand so, to Zillow. She got the home back, but none of Jerry's possessions were left inside. All of our family pictures were gone. They tossed them. So it was, it was hard. She says she found some of the items for sale on the internet. Meantime, police were closing in on who did this and how. They now say this man, 30-year-old Vicente Anzu from the Los Angeles area, impersonated Jerry Gottlieb, who was 84 when he died. I think there was a lot of red flags. How nobody spotted those red flags, from Zillow to the real estate agents to the title company, is an open question. The criminal um, used, had an ID, and it showed that he was um, like born in 1988. My dad bought the house in 1978. Uh, nobody put that together. The people involved in this case agree real estate agents need to be more aware of this kind of crime. See, I just created a deed fraud class for real estate agents and brokers that I submitted to the Department of Real Estate to help agents start to learn about the red flags. As it turns out, it was the fact that the suspect, Vicente Anzu, used a notary in California that got him caught. If he would have signed here, he would have never been caught. But in California, the two notaries took a fingerprint. Here, we don't take fingerprints. Experts say deed fraud has become easier as face-to-face -face interactions become less frequent in home sales. Welcome back to Investigate TV. One million phishing attacks in just three months. 
That's a record, according to industry experts. Researchers say attempts have more than tripled since 2020. Carice Jackman lists some of the most popular targets in this watching your wallet. It's just sad that to me, I guess, that uh, somebody could fall for that. Growing up in a world filled with social media sites and apps, 19-year-old Nathaniel McCormick said nothing ever really surprised him. Scam uh, calls or spam mail. I've grown up in this generation, so I know a little bit about that. Until one morning when he said he woke up to a loaded inbox. And like all of my friends got weird messages. His Facebook account had been hacked. The message sent to his friend said, look who died, with a bunch of sad emoji faces and a link to click on. But that link was an attempt by hackers to fish his friends. Anyone who clicked could have jeopardized critical personal information. And when it comes to being victimized by phishing attacks, Nathaniel and his friends aren't alone. We had re inbound reports that have been, you know, verified through our system of well over a million records. Peter Cassidy is Secretary General for the Anti-Phishing Working Group, or APWG. They analyze cybercrime, and in their latest data, phishing reached an all-time high in the first quarter of 2022. What we see is not all that's out there. It's the shadow analog representation of larger trends worldwide, uh, and it's scary. Data from APWG shows the industries targeted most often by phishing attacks. Social media is at 12 percent. The largest, the financial sector, including banks and payment apps, at 24 percent. Cassidy was even recently targeted with a banking scam while shopping online. As soon as I saw the follow-up was, I need to pay for this upfront in Zelle. And no, we can't take credit cards. I knew what was going on. So what can you do? Cassidy says slow down and make sure the message you received makes sense. Also, keep your internet security software up to date. And if you need to pay to update your computers, do it. But make sure you find qualified people to help you. From the perspective of the attackers, you are always a mark ready to be ripened and harvested. It's why Nathaniel's sharing his story. I was able to like change my security, uh, change my password. He hopes to prevent others from being hacked or scammed and ending up as a statistic on the next phishing trend report. One glimmer of hope. Cassidy says ransomware actually decreased in the first three months of 2022. Experts attribute that to a drop in attacks from two prolific ransomware groups. To keep up with our latest investigations, follow us on social media. We are at Investigate TV on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Welcome back to Investigate TV. Getting ahead is part of the American dream. Earning a promotion at work, scoring a bigger apartment, maybe a new car, and your credit report plays a part in that. Employers check it, potential landlords review it, and it's a near necessity for a loan. But according to TransUnion, more than 15% of U.S. adults are credit unserved or underserved. Dawn G. from our station in Louisville, Kentucky has more. Credit is really important in a consumer's life, especially for that economic advancement and upward mobility. Credit is a consumer's financial power. 45 million Americans are either unserved or credit underserved. These are consumers who do not have a bank account or who do not use mainstream financial services and primarily conduct transactions in cash. Breaking it down, about 8.1 million of them are credit invisible. And when you look at the rest of the 37 million Americans, they are credit underserved because they have very little participation. With a lack of credit, how do you get that first credit card or car loan? Credit score is a picture of you as a consumer and the risk that you entail. Many lenders are hesitant to extend credit to consumers without any credit history or score. Having no credit score can be the equivalent of having a poor credit score. Assuming you have recurring expenses, ask those companies to report on your behalf, such as rent, utilities, or your cell phone. Three things you must do as you get your credit and build your credit. Number one most important thing would be 
understanding your credit report. Get access to your credit report. Make sure you're looking at it on a regular basis, not a one and done. Secondly, make your payments on time. And if you're going to miss any of those payments, call your lender. Maybe they'll put you on a payment plan that's more affordable for you. And lastly, don't overextend yourself beyond your financial capacity that you have to manage your credit. Dawn gave us a couple of tips for the credit underserved or unserved looking to build up credit history. She says pay your rent, electric and cable bill on time, then have those companies report your payments. Also, try a secured or prepaid credit card. They report to all three major credit bureaus and you won't be able to overspend. And some good news for those of you with student loans, the COVID moratorium on student loan payments boosted people's credit scores. That's according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It says by the end of 2021, roughly 80% of student loan borrowers saw their credit scores go up. That's about 30 million people. Those who were delinquent on payments before the pandemic saw the largest score jumps with a median boost of more than 100 points. If you're looking for more investigative reporting on demand, download our streaming apps on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire TV. And that's it for us. Thanks for joining us here on Investigate TV. We'll see you next week.